These are men that had seen death, had stared it in the face. They had experienced blows and counter blows. They'd seen their comrades die from uh, suffocation, from entombment. They'd seen it all. And so their expectation, like any other soldier, was that their job would hasten the end of the war. These men, who intimately experienced death, were part of special units. They were experts in underground explosions during World War I. Over four years, beneath the nightmare of trenches and ongoing assaults, Allied and German troops transformed the Western Front's underground into its own battlefield. They fought mercilessly through secret operations, of which very little footage remains. This underground war was almost a different war from that of 1914. It was a war of moles, rats, and cave dwellers. It was something totally different, and yet it was the same 1914 war we know, just in a way we don't usually talk about. It's this other war that we are going to show you. It began in Flanders, Belgium, at the foot of a hill known as Hill 60. In 1915, this impregnable bastion was heavily defended by the Germans. It was witness to a baptism by fire for British soldiers who would change the course of the war along with unprecedented underground explosions. If you're on the top of the mine, you would be annihilated. You would, there would be no chance of finding any human remains of you. You would be blown, you would just be vaporized. Beneath Arras, in Pas de Calais, we'll dive deep beneath a top secret operation, a giant underground construction site with 20 kilometers of quarries and tunnels, which offered protection to British soldiers and allowed them to carry out an assault with 24,000 men right under the noses of German soldiers. Everything was kept secret. It had to be a surprise, much like a Trojan horse. The climax of this underground war took place in Messine in Belgium on June 7, 1917, when the detonation of 19 British mines containing 470 tons of explosives led to the greatest pre-nuclear explosion in history. It had never been seen before at that extent, and it's never been seen since. It must have been absolutely hell on earth. Western Flanders. This is where lies the hill that led to the death and destruction of Allied and German soldiers that fought here. It's known as Hill 60. A dozen meters high, it lies like a wart on the flat land of its surroundings. Full of shell holes and craters, it alone symbolizes the craziness of the deadly fight that took place beneath the traditional battlefront. In February 1915, Hill 60 was heavily defended by the German army. The German trench would be full with soldiers returning with, in, with uh, rifle fire. Once you launch an attack above the ground, you're going through a killing zone. There would be almost no option to survive this. And yet, the British managed to seize Hill 60, thanks to a massive subterranean operation of unprecedented scale. It marked the beginning of a war in the shadows that would usher the conflict into modern times, giving birth to new types of soldiers baptized by fire. Who were they? What were their weapons and tactics? To answer these questions, we have to look back at the start of the Great War, the beginning of the battle that would ultimately lead to over 18 million deaths. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand 
heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, was assassinated in Sarajevo. In retaliation, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia, which was backed by the Russians. Their alliance sprang to life, and thus began the First World War. On one side, the triple alliance between the empires of central Germany, Austro-Hungary, and Italy. On the other side, the French, the British, and the people of the Russian Empire. But after six months of combat, the Western Front was at an impasse. It stretched over 700 kilometers from the North Sea to Switzerland, something completely unexpected by Allied or German generals. What changed with World War I was this idea of static sides, entrenched armies, and war by siege. This was siege warfare over 700 kilometers on the French front. Germany occupied the majority of Belgium and was a threat to Great Britain. It controlled the North, Artois, and Champagne in France. Even repeated Allied attacks couldn't push the Germans out. From that moment on, every division went full force into the war. And as soon as you get a trench line that spreads from the North Sea, to the Swiss frontier, you have a fortress, the longest fortress in history. And as soon as you have a fortress, the only way you're going to break a fortress down is using siege weapons, one of which, a major part of which, is mine warfare, digging underneath these fortifications to blow them to, and to force the Germans back. These underground siege techniques are as old as war itself. Armies had been using them for thousands of years. But at the beginning of the modern 20th century, they'd been forgotten. Moreover, the British Army didn't have the men necessary for these kinds of attacks. Looking to break through the German walls from underneath, a loyal servant of His Majesty and fine strategist named John Norton Griffiths was convinced he could change the stakes. Under his entrepreneurship, his workers had dug the Manchester sewers and the tunnels of the London subway. Those men would be even more useful digging beneath the German trenches than beneath British soil, which was at risk of invasion. He's an engineer. He understands ground. He is an MP, so he has a position of power. He is a man who is impatient. And people that knew him describe him variously as sort of a, a go-getter or man of action. These workers were known as moles, and he wanted to transform them into soldiers. To do so, he had to convince one of the empire's most important men, Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener. Norton Griffiths wrote this rather strange letter to Kitchener suggesting that he used his moles, uh, which were the men that he used to dig these sewers. John Norton Griffiths' letter would go unanswered. And yet, time was of the essence. A worrisome rumor began to spread within the army. In Festubert, in Pas de Calais, the Germans managed to slip hundreds of kilos of explosives beneath a British trench. They were set off on December 20th, 1914, with staggering results. In a matter of seconds, his Majesty's army lost 800 men. And at Festubert, uh, this woke the British to the, to the reality that they were going to be undermined, that this fortification, albeit some ditches, would be undermined and mines were blown there. And so the British were saying, hold on a minute, if this is going to take place, if the Germans are going to start using this, it becomes a war where we have to outsmart each other. In mid-February 1915, John Norton Griffiths was called to meet with the Secretary for War. He was finally face to face with the Iron Man of the British Empire, Lord Kitchener. To convince him to launch an underground war using his moles, John Norton Griffiths had found a way to modernize old techniques, 
an advantage that would allow the British to gain the upper hand. Now, Norton Griffiths knew, because of all of the geological knowledge that was available to him, that the clay of Flanders was the same as the clay of London. The clay can be quite a difficult thing to dig. If you've ever dug in a garden with a soil made out of clay, you'll know how tiring it is. He demonstrated how his men could dig very quickly through the clay that was to be found uh, beneath uh, Flanders. This advantage was a digging technique known as clay kicking. A worker would use his legs to force his shovel blade deep into the clay. Then using his arms, he'd tip the shovel handle to detach the clay, while another worker would remove the resulting debris. Norton Griffiths knew that his technique of clay kicking would mean that the Allies would be able to dig tunnels rapidly, that they would be able to dig tunnels relatively quietly. And so this was like a magic technique that Norton Griffiths could say, you could use it, Kitchener would have the advantage over the Germans who are not, as far as they knew, using clay kicking. Faced with this convincing demonstration, Lord Kitchener put his faith in John Norton Griffiths and tasked him with building a shadow army of soldiers capable of changing the course of the conflict. Thanks to the British miners, the underground war was about to take on a new dimension. Recruited by John Norton Griffiths, they formed the first team of tunnelers. In just a few days in February 1915, they were assembled and sent to the Western Flanders Front. There, the British defended the half-fallen city of Ypres, a city that needed to remain in their power at all costs. The British had made a commitment to holding this town, making sure that their supply lines were uh, secure. The port of Calais in France faced Dover, was just 30 kilometers from England. So they needed to protect the English Channel ports. So Ypres became the major part of British strategy. Less than four kilometers south of the city, the Empire's tunnelers began digging at the base of a small hill, then occupied by the Germans and known as Hill 60. In February 1915, it was one of the most intense battle arenas in the region and a thorn in the side of the British defense at Ypres. Here, just a few dozen meters separated the British from the German front line. They would always take in the higher spots in the landscape. Hill 6 is one of these places where you would have a splendid view. From here, you would look into the communication trenches. You would be able to observe infantry moves. You would be, uh, and perhaps it's even the most important, you would be able to direct your artillery fire straight upon the, the targets. At Hill 60, like elsewhere, the German army followed meticulously destructive orders defend the heavily armed front line at all costs. For their baptism by fire, John Norton Griffith's tunnelers had to make it to the end of this German stronghold. Their plan was to dig 30 meter long tunnels towards the most fortified sections of the hill, then detonate the mines. At the same time, surface infantry would attack to seize the territory. a new kind of war was taking place below the battlefields. One between the Germans and the Allied troops. A war of shadows, a silent war that represented a turning point in military engineering. They were in the tunnels in total silence. They couldn't see the enemy. They couldn't see anything. It was a war of moles, rats, and cave dwellers. If you're digging a tunnel, you're doing it as quietly as possible. 
why the Germans are sitting here. They were having also, they were also digging tunnels. Uh, they would be listening below the surface, listening to the sound of enemy miners coming closer. And so they would use techniques that would magnify that. So for example, uh, cans of water. Putting your ear to that, the water would magnify the sound uh, that was passing through the strata. In this silent world of mine warfare, the British tunnelers had to advance quickly without being noticed. So being as quiet as possible was of greatest importance, hence clay kicking, a silent technique. Pushing your pick into the ground was a lot, a lot uh, more silent than hacking away with a pick. By early April 1915, the tunnelers had built three subterranean structures with blast chambers. In each, they placed 1,200 kilograms of powder, totaling close to five tons of explosives. But before detonating them, they filled the tunnels with sandbags and debris. Mine chambers here. If something explodes, the pressure goes to where it can go. So you have to make sure that you damp, that you uh, create uh, barriers of sandbags below the surface to counter for the explosive effect from the mine. If you counter that effect, the explosive goes upwards and then it creates a mine crater. And that's the effect that you want. You want to annihilate the German defenses so that your infantry can attack as easily as possible. April 17th, 1915, 6 p.m. In the British trenches facing Hill 60, the tunnelers connected their fuses to the detonators. In the German trenches, all was calm that day. If you're a German soldier sitting on the edge of Hill 60 and the mines would go on, that means that if you're on the top of the mine, you would be annihilated. You would, there would be no chance of finding any human remains of you. You would be blown, you would just be vaporized. If you're a little bit further, you would feel the shockwave. You would be trembled and it adds to the psychological effect of something detonates. The mines were detonated in a, within 10 seconds not all simultaneously, so there will be one mine here, one mine there. You wouldn't know where is the next mine. And at that point, you have the infantry coming over. They succeeded in taking the hill in uh, less than 10 minutes. There was almost no resistance. The 105th Infantry Regiment, Saxon soldiers, which were keeping this hill, they were either killed by the explosive, they were bayoneted in the hand-to-hand -hand fighting, or they were taken uh, prisoners. Just a few days later, the Germans launched a surface counterattack. They used a new terrifying and devastating weapon, toxic gas. The next level of atrocity in the Great War. British soldiers fled the site and Hill 60 was lost again, back under German control. But one thing was certain, at Hill 60, the British tunnelers had made up for their losses against the Germans thanks to their underground ingenuity. In 1915, the front was still at a standstill between Germany and England, as well as between Germany and France. Only the mines provided a ray of hope at progress. With every new tunnel came the promise of hitting deeper with more powerful explosives as never before seen in the history of mankind. Arras, spring 1917. Devoid of inhabitants and bombed daily by the German artillery, the capital of Artois was in ruins. The city had been under siege for three years and was more than half destroyed. The remaining structures were little more than dollhouses, with destroyed facades where one could see everything happening inside. And yet, this ruined city was where 24,000 British soldiers awaited their signal to attack. 
they gathered in secrecy, unbeknownst to the Germans, in the heart of a massive underground structure, a 20-kilometer network of quarries and tunnels that would change the course of the war. Who dug these tunnels? Why did the British choose Arras as the base for their underground offensive? To understand, we have to go back a few months to the summer of 1916. Since the start of the Battle of Verdun, the British had been defending Arras on their own. The city was a particularly vulnerable location on the front line that the Germans wanted to capture. Arras was a hub for road and railway communication. And if seized, the Allies would be forced to pull back to Edin or Montreuil, almost to the coast. So if the Germans captured the city, they would then occupy a large part of the Pas de Calais and would leave the British shipping ports vulnerable, which Britain obviously wanted to avoid. So they needed to keep their position at Arras at all costs. Those ports now welcomed new tunneling recruits. They were part of the Commonwealth and came from the other side of the globe, New Zealand, on the British Crown's request to aid in the war effort. Overnight, they went from working in mines to being charged with digging battle tunnels deep beneath Arras. A lot of those men uh, are Maori men. They are men who are not afraid of hard work. They are men who are used to putting in what the British would call hard graft, the capability of working hard underground. But as they began digging their first tunnels 20 meters beneath Arras, they came across an extraordinary discovery, colossal cavities where for centuries, Arras quarrymen had dug away the limestone that had been used to decorate the city's facades. It was an incredibly fortunate discovery. They were initially charged with digging long tunnels beneath their enemies so that they could blow up their frontline trenches. That was the first order of business. But while doing that, while digging their battle tunnels, they regularly came upon existing quarries. These quarries could potentially alter the course of the war. The British army was traumatized and needed a new military strategy, one that would avoid another massacre like the Somme Offensive. That battle saw them rising out of the trenches and being cut down in thousands by machine guns. Now, some estimates suggest on the first day that there were 40,000 casualties, and that means 40,000 less or fewer men able to take the fight. Something had to change. In November, when the fighting stopped, 1.2 million people were dead, and the German front was still strong and intact. To finally break through the German front, the Allies prepared a new major attack for the spring of 1917. It was meant to change everything and put an end to the war. It would be led by the French Army's new commander-in-chief, General Robert Nivelle. The attack was planned for spring 1917 in Aisne on the Chemin des Dames. The goal, to end the war in under 48 hours. To ensure success, General Nivelle asked his British counterpart, Marshal Haig, to initiate a diversionary attack in Artois. General Haig's objective for the Battle of Arras was to create a diversion that would attract as many German reinforcements as possible. They had to believe there was a large offensive. 
So they prepared lots of equipment, a lot of shells, and a lot of men. They needed the Germans to fall for it. And the idea is that the two attacks will go in at roughly the same time, and they will be converging to um, cut off a huge chunk of the German positions. The gigantic caves of Arras would be the perfect cover for a secret operation, the first of its kind. The quarries would allow them to assemble and protect an army of 24,000 men, while also allowing them to reach the front without being under enemy fire by the way of assault tunnels. Two major tunnels would allow troops to emerge, which would overwhelm the Germans. There would be so many men in the front lines that when they went over the top with coordinated artillery fire, the British would be able to drive the Germans back. What was different here was the use of the underground passages, the quarries, and the tunnels to get their men as close to the German lines as possible for an unexpected attack, using the element of surprise. The New Zealand tunnelers were the architects of this top secret operation. British High Command gave them the mission of digging 20 kilometers of tunnels to connect the various quarries. In the north, they formed the Saint Saveur network. In the south, the Ronville network. Their goal was to build an edifice capable of protecting a colossal army of 24,000 men, the world's largest underground shelter. The idea was that the entire network had to be built in less than six months. They made it clear that they wanted to attack in the spring, which meant that 20 kilometers of tunnels needed to be finished in five or six months at the very most. For the tunnelers that were working under Arras, it, it definitely was a race against time because the offensive that was going to be fought, not just by the British and the Canadians, but also by the French, had to jump off on that one day, it had to be on the 9th of April. Underground, photography of the top secret operation was strictly forbidden. Only a few rare images of this industrial work site still exist today. Three teams of 200 people worked eight-hour shifts, day and night, with constant turnover. You can imagine the tension below ground. You can imagine the way in which these men were having to work uh, shift after shift because their only aim was to deliver those tunnels. The three New Zealand teams had a competition between them. One of the teams actually established a record as they dug a tunnel over 100 meters long in a matter of barely eight hours. Every day there were dozens of tons of rubble that needed to be removed from the active tunnels. But it couldn't be brought to the surface. German aviators flew over the city daily. The presence of that much rubble would instantly give away the secret operation. So it had to be kept underground. They built piles of debris, like this one here, throughout the tunnels. Everything was kept secret. It had to be a surprise, much like a Trojan horse. They also had to avoid being discovered underground. German pioneers were also digging tunnels out from their own trenches towards no man's land. So it was not out of the question that they could discover the Allies' massive underground structure. So this is an example of the security system found in each tunnel that was dug by the New Zealanders from 1916 onwards. Holes on either side of the tunnels were lined with explosives. And if ever the enemy forces discovered them, they could decide to detonate the explosives and destroy the tunnels. So this was in every tunnel in the Arras network. March 1917, the
the New Zealand tunnelers managed to connect the different quarries and built a network of tunnels that would allow soldiers to cross into no man's land without taking enemy fire. Everybody was waiting for them to finish that task. Without them, men would have had to have crossed in, into no man's land without the protection of those tunnels. So it was an immense pressure, and they were part of a huge and growing military machine. The British Army sent one regiment after another as discreetly as possible towards Arras, readying their troops for the April 9th attack. They were 24,000, roughly equivalent to the population of Arras before the war. In the center of the old town, this seemingly innocuous door would lead them to the quarries. A week before the Battle of Arras and the brutal bombing of the Germans, there were 24,000 British soldiers who passed through this door. Underground, the sewer network gave access to the massive underground structure, where they were then guided to their quarters. They came down in here and were able to walk some three kilometers into no man's land without a single shell flying over their heads. The first week of April, the medieval quarries of Arras would bear witness to a strange spectacle, that of 24,000 soldiers gathering and killing time as they waited for the signal to attack. This very much resembles typical soldiers' quarters. Here is a biscuit tin that was punctured at the base. It was then filled with charcoal and used to heat up McConaughey stew or perhaps tins of pork and beans, a typical British military meal. And here we have a bottle of champagne. Now this is something really unique because it must have meant that a special celebration must have happened here. April 8, 1917, on the other side of the front, the Germans have been subject to four days of incessant bombing. The first phase of the operation, known as the Week of Suffering, was underway. For the soldiers gathered beneath Arras, attack was imminent. The success of the operation would depend on the first wave, which would erupt from tunnels I-54 and I-56. Those were mere meters from the German trenches. It was meant to be a first commando raid carried out quickly. The soldiers burst out of the tunnels and took out the German sentinels along the front to keep them from sounding the alarm or screaming for help. As soon as those men are in the trenches, then it's hand-to-hand -hand war. It's fighting with your bayonet. It's using your grenade. It is the awful, awful pictures of the war of 1914-18. But the tunnels have allowed your men to get into the frontline trenches in a fresh state so that they can do that. And so it becomes part of a total package of war. The soldiers emerged just a few meters from the front line and made it all the way to the village of Tilois, where some Germans, for example, were still in pajamas having breakfast. So the attack was a complete surprise. The break through the German line was spectacular. In one day, no less than 10 kilometers of terrain was conquered. However, the fight at the front line was far from over. The German defense was ferocious. After a month of combat, the Artois offensive no longer advanced, and the British army was losing 4,000 men a day. The French on the Chemin des Dames were not faring any better. When the French attacked on the Chemin des Dames, 
It was a catastrophe. They lost 100,000 men in 15 days. The first day, Nivelle had promised they'd break through, as they were supposed to capture 10 kilometers of land. But the French only advanced 500 meters, and it was a massacre. In spring 1917, the Allies had to start from scratch. The defeated French forces looked to British commander Marshal Haig to take the reins for what was believed to be the final attack, their last chance at success. A battle in which mine warfare would play a major role was about to yield the greatest man-made explosion of its kind ever seen. Flanders in Belgium. A muddy nightmare for British forces. A nightmare which could only end with a decisive final attack on German forces. Haig's great plan was to launch an attack in Flanders that would liberate the Belgian coast, to then protect the British territories from any future threat. The idea was also to eliminate the risk of submarine warfare since German submarines operated out of Belgian bases. So what Haig wanted to do was to secure the war in Flanders, using the flat ground, the flat terrain, the capability of driving deeply into Germany and to beat the Germans and to win that war. In Flanders, the situation hadn't changed since the end of 1914. British forces were still defending the city of Ypres, or what remained of it. The Germans still occupied the higher ground facing it. The Passchendaele Ridge in the north and the Messines Ridge in the south. The German front was spread out over 20 kilometers, from Hill 60, where the British tunnelers had experienced their baptism by fire, all the way to the village of Weichkata and on to Messines. Since 1914, the Germans had had more than two years to transform the area into an impenetrable and heavily defended fortress. The Germans were masters of creating this as a massive fortress. They're making sure that the Allies do not break through while they fight in the east. The idea is once they've beaten the Russians, they will transfer their divisions to the west and divide the British and French and break them apart. And that's the idea behind this. To this day, the battlefields of Flanders have yet to reveal all their secrets. A century after the Great War, archaeologists and historians continue to find remnants of this German fortress, such as this blockhouse. Places like this, there would be hundreds on top of the ridge, and these would be the typical places where the, uh, the Allied, the attackers, uh, would have to uh, pass and would have to uh, fight to. Places like this would be very difficult to take because you could take shelter here during an artillery fire. The moment that the artillery fire stops, soldiers would be knowing that the attack was uh, imminent. They would know that the Allies would be attacking from this side, would take out, and they would be able to defend this place. The British had their eyes on this impenetrable fortress. They'd been trying to seize it since 1915 under the guidance of Major John Norton Griffiths, who had created the first teams of tunnelers. This time, he had another plan in mind that would change everything, which he called the Great Idea. His idea was that if you coordinated the effort, if we can lay a mine under each one of those fortifications, those strong points, and if we were to blow those at the single time to create something as titanic as an earthquake, then maybe we can destroy the front line, push the Germans off the ridge, and the British would be able to capture that ridge. John Norton Griffiths realized the region was of vital strategic importance for the British, helped by studies done by Australian military geologist Edgeworth David. Beneath the layer of wet sand at Messines, you have the dry clay. And if, if they could get down to the dry clay, it was comparatively 
easy and quick to tunnel through the dry clay. The deeper layer of dry clay was ideal for digging tunnels and offered special advantages to British tunnelers. It was extremely water resistant, keeping the water just below the feet of the Germans that it was almost impossible for them to dig down to counter any kind of mining that might be carried out by the British. John Norton Griffith's great idea began to take shape. It meant digging shafts to reach the dry clay layer, then digging tunnels that would make up the battle network. There were 22 key locations on the ridge. When detonated simultaneously, these mines would provoke an earthquake that would create an opening for the infantry. Canadians from the 3rd Division, Commonwealth members who had joined the war effort early, had undertaken the mission of digging the longest war tunnel ever built. It was designed to finally take down the German stronghold. This underground structure was over 300 meters long and nicknamed Berlin. Berlin Tunnel was nicknamed so uh, because the tunnelers made a joke that if they would continue digging at the same rate, they would end up in Berlin. So the tunnel was constructed somewhere at that tree. The tunnel was going all the way below here, next to the railway embankment. It would go to the uh, bridge. They would be going very deep, in some places as deep as 30 meters below the surface. And it would be way below the German defensive. The operation was top secret. The Germans couldn't know that tunnelers had reached the dry clay, so all debris had to be meticulously hidden. Now, how do you get rid of that material? Do you put it in a stockpile? No, the aviators will see it, and they'll see it shining on the ground there. Do you put it into sandbags to support the trenches? No, because, again, the greenish-blue colour will show through those. It was a real difficulty to remove that out of the way. So there was not just a war of silence and noise, but there was also a war going on of camouflage. A lot of archaeological work that's been done recently has shown this blue clay actually within shell holes, showing how the British were trying to remove this material, or they could ship it out as far as they could on trench railways out of the frontline zone, so they're out of the eyes uh, of the German aviators. Everything changed in March 1916. While preparing for an attack, British forces detonated several deep mines in Saint-Éloi. The resulting caverns were a valuable clue for the Germans. The Germans were able to work out that uh, the British had got into the blue clay because uh, the British were unable to keep possession of the craters that were blown in March of 1916. And the Germans had the craters, they could see the depth of the craters, and they could see the clay that was thrown up from the explosions. So it was clear that uh, the British had got down to that level. There was no longer any doubt for the German army. They knew the British were digging deeply beneath the Messine Ridge. August 1916. Most of the tunnels and blast chambers were complete. While the attack kept being delayed, the tunnelers had to continuously protect themselves and maintain the blast chambers, which were stocked with ammonal, a super powerful explosive. At the same time, the German army brought a mine warfare expert into the Messine region, Lieutenant Colonel Otto Fußlein. Otto Fisslein uh, was a, a civilian mining engineer who also commanded an engineer regiment which was at Les Epages, which was almost as important as Vauquois in terms of the intensity of the, the mine warfare. So with Fusslein arriving, you got the capability of one technical scientist, a man who knows his trade, combating the men on the other side. Bruce Line knew the British forces were a step ahead. To see his mission through, he recruited additional pioneers. Those were experts in underground work. The Germans begin to create specialist mining units 
uh, in imitation, it seems, of the British tunneling companies. One of the consequences of that, of course, is that the Germans are now starting to be able to countermine the British. Fuslein needed to find a way to reach the dry clay, where he feared the British were already hard at work. To that end, he had the pioneers build steel cylindrical casings. These casings allowed the miners to pour concrete down the shafts through water-gorged soil layers until they reached the clay as they worked to destroy the British tunnels underground. The main purpose of shafts like this is getting deep very quickly. It's easier to dig a shaft. Once you lower your shaft, you're protected from water and sand running in your uh, wooden shaft. So by digging a shaft like this, it would enable you to go down, and it would also keep your entrance safe. Position was well camouflaged, and this means that the Germans also didn't want to let the British know that they were mining, that they were, that they were knowing what the other one was doing. It was always a cat and mouse play. And wherever they heard British activity or suspected British activity because of spoil and waste materials, they would then sink shafts using these concrete rings to get beneath ground to seek out the British. Thanks to these mine shafts, the Germans could now hear the British through the clay and destroy their tunnels. For the tunnelers, this meant taking utmost precautions to avoid discovery of completed or in-progress tunnels. Like the tunnelers on Hill 60, they used a decoy. The decoy was a second set of tunnels built above the main network with the sole purpose of distracting the Germans. They used uh, a system of uh, shallower tunnel galleries, partly that were already dug, to carry out noisy, pointless activity that would not only disguise the deeper work, but would also confuse the German listeners. In those tunnels, quite often, you see picks which are on an automatic system, which allow the pick to hit the ground on a regular basis. And this noise would pass through the ground conditions, which would attract the Germans like bees to a honeypot. So they were dragging away the attention of the deep system. The deep system, which would be the hardest to uh, keep you in, in a low level. You don't want the Germans to know that the system uh, is there, so you're not making any noise at all. Otto Fuslein's miners took the bait and blasted Camoufle in Spanbrookmullen, Kreustadt, Ontario Farm, and Hill 60. In response, the toddlers turned to a unique weapon only they possessed. British composure. If the enemy have managed to destroy a dummy tunnel, a tunnel which is built there simply to attract their attention, then why would you fight back? Would you not just allow the Germans to think, ah, we've destroyed the tunnel, there's no further activity, we can rest easy in our beds. It's better to leave them, better to leave that tunnel prepared and ready to go and to sacrifice the tunnel that you've built simply to attract their attention. The British artillery had rained fire on the Messines Ridge for over a month. When suddenly, all was quiet. Just a few hours before the attack, British tunnelers of the 171st Division made final preparations in the Ontario farm blast chambers. The British general in charge of the attack, Herbert Plummer, declared, Gentlemen, I do not know whether tomorrow will change the course of history, but we will certainly change the geography. The expectation was of Plumer and his staff that when they pushed those plungers and the artillery bombardment started, that they would take that ridge. And that that tension was immense. June 7th, 1917, 2.55 a.m. 
the greatest quantity of explosives ever assembled by mankind, 470 tons, distributed in 19 mines, are ready to be detonated. Captain Oliver Woodward later said, the general entered the shelter with a watch in his hand. You could hear a pin drop in the silence as he counted down six, five, four, three, two, one. The detonations of these mines were so heavy that actually in geological institutes in Europe, um, in Netherlands or in France, that the mine detonations were actually recorded on the seismograph. What well, was very frightening for the Germans that all the mines didn't detonate all in once. There was one mine, a second mine, a third mine. But doing so, they didn't know where the next mine would be, which caused extra panic uh, amongst the Germans. When that went up, they must have been struck dumb by the awesome noise and effect that that was uh, delivering because it had never been seen before at that extent and it's never been seen since. I cannot imagine what those men went through and how they experienced, how they even survived that uh, action of both exploding mines and the shell bombardment it must have been absolutely hell on earth. In just a few days, the British Army managed to dispel all German forces from the mine-blasted ridge. This battle was the culmination of this secret, deadly, underground war. A war which would, little by little, be extinguished until the Germans were defeated. Like the Great War, the Underground War would never be replicated.